Good morning, everyone. It's Amy Clausen here with the Niagara on the Lake Museum. And thanks again for joining us uh, for our virtual lecture series for 2022. Uh, this is the second to the last talk. So thank you for uh, coming along the journey with us. Uh, we'll be recording today's uh, webinar as we usually do. So we'll be posting this on YouTube and sending out links afterwards. So for any reason you get kicked out or you can't stay for the full thing, do not worry, you'll be able to watch it afterwards. And as always, we have our chat box and the Q&A functions open. So feel free to uh, put questions in anytime you want. Um, most of the time we'll do them at the end of the presentation, but because this format is a little more conversational um, with questions going back and forth throughout, um, there might be times uh, throughout that we'll, we'll stop and do some questions. So feel free to put those in, in the chat box or the Q&A at any point. Um, and as usual too, we always appreciate donations to our free programming here at the museum. So I will put a link in the chat box for donations and uh, we've uh, appreciated all the support we've received throughout the series and last year as well from our donors. So today we have two special guests with us. Leonard Connolly is the, is the past president and vice chancellor of Trent University, holds degrees from four universities around the world, was professor of English at the universities of Saskatchewan, Alberta, Guelph, and Trent, and has authored more than 60 articles and 20 books, including many about Bernard Shaw. And I hear he has a new one coming out, which he'll tell us about. Uh, he also founded the Theatre Archives at the University of Guelph, the largest collection of Canadian theatre archives available and one of the world's most important collections of Bernard Shaw material. And Barbara Worthy has had a long-term relationship with the Shaw from acting in the Christopher Newton Company, directing and writing under Jack Jackie Maxwell, teaching during the Tim Carroll years, as well as producing the Bell Canada series, Shaw Film Festival series for a decade with CBC Radio. Many of you probably know Babs uh, from her work here at the museum as a staff member and from the many historical projects she's produced in the Niagara region, both at the museum and uh, throughout other historic sites. So I will turn it over to the two of you. Thanks, Amy. Well, there we are. Hello, hello everybody. And hello, Leonard. And aren't we lucky hello. to be here? So we're gonna kick it off with this. If I can be very technical, I'm gonna sh share my screen. And we're going to have somebody else welcome us in. Here we go. I'm going to do this. Here we go. Oh boy, taking a long. Hold on. Here we go. Hello, America. Hello. All my friends in America. Hello, all you dear boos who have been saying for a month past that I have gone dotty about Russia. Well, if the latest news from your side is true, you can hardly be saying that now. Russia has the laugh of us. She has us fools, beat, shame, shown up. Okay, I will take it out at that point, and I will ask Leonard to explain what we just saw. Well, that's the first time I've seen it. Um, so perhaps thank you for recovering that from somewhere in the depths of the wonderful YouTube. <laughs> YouTube. Uh, uh, the speaker was a man named Bernard Shaw, uh, and he was speaking in in 1931 uh, on the BBC to America via shortwave. And he was talking to America and criticizing America for failing to convert to communism. Yeah. He'd been to Russia. He'd celebrated his 75th birthday in Moscow, attended by 2000 people in the Great Hall of Moscow. He'd spent four hours chatting privately to Stalin, and he'd come back from Russia full of admiration for all that he believed Russia was achieving. Bearing in mind that early 1930s, for many people, democracy was failing, right? I mean, widespread unemployment, poverty, child malnutrition, massive social inequality, uh, things weren't going well for democracy. He went to Russia. He saw what Stalin wanted him to see. He didn't see any of the death camps, 
but he didn't see beggars on the streets. He didn't see the widespread poverty that uh, he knew existed in New York and certainly he witnessed in London. So he had some grounds like other intellectuals for being favorably inclined towards Russia. The problem was that he never changed his mind. He uh, late, later satirized uh, other dictators, Hitler, Mussolini, Franco, but never Stalin. And when Shaw visited Russia, uh, visited America in, for the first time in 1933, he continued his theme that Russia had got it right, America had got it wrong. What did he uh, have on his fireplace, I, Leonard? What, what were the busts on his fireplace in his home? Uh, do you think it was Stalin wrong? He had the four busts. What were they? Who were they? In his Remind home. me. He had, uh, well, he had Mussolini, he had Hitler, he had Lenin, and the, and the busts, and you can see them in his fireplace, on his fireplace. He, he did, but eventually, as I say, re rejected, in, in the play Geneva, rejected all of them except Stalin, uh, which is sad, but the reality. And by the way, there's a phrase that you heard from Shaw in that talk. He says, hello, you dear boobs. Uh, I happen to have a new book coming out. Uh, it's on Shaw and America. And the title I wanted for the book was, hello, you dear boobs, colon, Bernard Shaw and America. My publisher said, Sorry, Leonard. Um, it does have other connotations. We're not going to use that title. Uh, it will, the title will attract wide interest, but not of the sort that you uh. <laughs> expected it to. Your royalties might go up, but you'll have a lot of disappointed readers. So it is now more prosaically, more accurately called um, Bernard Shaw on the American stage. And there's a chapter in there about his uh, anti-democratic plays um, uh, and then a discussion of his visits to America, uh, especially in 1933. But uh, uh, Shaw's politics are always controversial. Uh, I have many friends. Let's, let's go back and think about that because when he, when the festival started here, let's go back to the days, let's go back chronologically a little. Yep. Did those politics come into play when? When Brian Doherty wanted to start the festival, did anybody object? No, not, not initially, no. Uh, they have since then, um, and they might come back because a few years ago uh, there were uh, actually from, from Ukrainians uh, complaints that the Shaw Festival was championing the plays of Bernard Shaw, who had not criticized Stalin, for many things, including what he did to Ukraine. And, it, it, and the defense is that there you must distinguish between Shaw the man, Shaw the political thinker, and Shaw the playwright. And what we celebrate, and I like sort of help build the defense, what we celebrate at the Shaw, the plays, the plays uh, are the thing that mattered to us. And if you started banishing playwrights and novelists and other writers on the basis not of their work, creative work but their politics you're on a very slippery slope but I think the thing to be honest about it many of my, my Shaw colleagues uh, say that Shaw was just being ironic uh, just being provocative didn't really mean it well I think, think he did and you just have to admit that that he got it wrong with Stalin yeah, apologies yeah. for the phone if you can hear it um, anyway that's, that was a lovely little clip Yes, and I mean, we have, there's lots of other clips of him over in the States talking, and I'm sure you'll be able to you know, use some of those transcripts. Are you using some of those transcripts in your book, in your upcoming book? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, and I published a book on Shaw on the BBC. It has the full text of that, um, that talk he, he, he gave. So here we are, we're looking at 60 years of Shaw, and of course there's a bit of a love-in for you and I. We both adore the festival and we adore Shaw even though obviously there's the political side of him that is, is sometimes, it's obviously got to be questionable, but the works, the works that made him the man he is, I am a complete devotee of his works, as you are too, I know. And it's thrilling to me that we still have the Shaw Festival 
honoring his work 60 years on my son thinks it's hilarious that I am now older than the Shaw Festival I don't know why he finds that so funny <laughs> he does but uh, so 60 years of the Shaw let's go back to the 60s let's go back to how it started and let's go back to the vision and the passion and and that summer festival of eight performances they put together tell us a little about how how it all came together Leonard. well uh, m many of you will know about Brian Doherty and, and Calvin Rand. Uh, Brian, apart from being a successful lawyer, was also a playwright and, and producer in, in New York. And he retired from Toronto to Niagara Lake and founded uh, a rather sleepy little town in the 50s and early 60s and wondered what could be done to uh, energize it. And he knew by then what Stratford had done with Shakespeare and the theater and wondered if the same could could happen to Niagara on the Lake. And so the, new it was place society, the New Play Society had been very much evident so since the 40s and the 50s as well, right? So we'd had quite an evidence, quite a, an upswing of interest in doing Canadian work and Canadian theater and Dora Mabel Moore's work was pretty prominent. Yeah. He would have known about all of that, right? Yeah. About that. Um, but he wanted a, a a big name playwright. He said, if you're going to build a festival, mm. uh, a theater festival, uh, and focus on a single playwright, you need a playwright who's written a significant body of work, big enough uh, that you can, you've got lots to choose from. Uh, Shakespeare's gone, thanks. <laughs> we, we can't do Shakespeare. Uh, who's left? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily going to be sure, because at one point it might have been Eugene O'Neill. Um, it could have been the O'Neill Festival. Um, it could have been the O'Casey Festival. Yes. But the Irishness in, in, in Doherty not only took him to O'Casey, but took him to Shaw and, of course, the body of work, over 50 plays, uh, of which, of which you know, maybe, maybe 10 or a dozen uh, could, could be classed as, as, as masterpieces and worth repeating. And the idea was you'd do sure and only sure because there was enough there to keep you going in, indefinitely. Uh, so with Calvin Rand's financial help and Calvin, as you all know, uh, had a summer home in, yes. uh, in Niagara on the Lake and um, came from a wealthy banking family. Uh, with Calvin's financial help and support, cash, uh, they had those small beginnings and slowly but surely built built on them. But it, it was, was a struggle. Uh, it was entirely chaotic at the beginning as well, wasn't it? I mean, they had no place. They had no place. They had the courthouse. They had. They managed to secure a space, but they had no place to make their costumes. They had no place for any sets or anything of that nature. And and basically, it was a home industry. As everyone in the in the oral histories and whatever you read about the, the early days, everyone was doing it from their home. They were sewing. They had, you know, they had people with their sewing machines dashing up to the theatre to sew during the shows, and they were borrowing all the props and the and the set pieces from everybody's home. Margarita Howe, as we know, and all those wonderful ladies back in the day, they were they were delivering everything they could from their own homes, including when Brian wanted more silver, more silver. They would run home and get more silver. And have you heard about the wonderful story when, because at the short house, they, the, score, the, the courthouse, they had no public washrooms for the, the cast. They just had the one, the loose downstairs. And so the actors didn't have their own washrooms and equity did find out about this and said it wasn't acceptable. And so they had to run and get a commode for the women and a bucket for the men. <laughs> <laughs> and when they brought the commode on, they dragged it across the stage the small little space that they were working on then and the audience got to see this commode being pulled across the stage that there was then going back for everybody to pee in. <laughs> and, and the audience got to hear things as well because you recall that the town jail uh, was still open in the courthouse at that time and there's a wonderful story when they were doing the reading of uh, Don Juan in Hell from Man and Superman uh, there was a drunk in the jail uh, suffering DTs and was screaming uh, as from hell. And that crept up to the auditorium as a suitable 
soundscape for Don Juan in hell. Very hot as well. There's no no air conditioning, of course, in no, the courthouse. Everybody talks yeah. about that. The heat was incredible. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no air conditioning. They had to run down. And if, if you open the windows, of course, you've got street noise. Uh, yes. And you've got you'd also got the town fire alarm was on top of the courthouse. So whenever that went off, the play had to to stop. Well, and that went Calvin, for many many years, didn't it? Many years we'd yeah, be in yeah. the courthouse, and the big thing then, of course, we're jumping ahead here, but you would hear the siren would go off and i know many of us will remember we just stood there as actors we just you just stood there the lights were slowly dimmed and right. just stayed and you waited for the sirens to finish siren to finish <clears throat> and then the lights would come up and you just carry on and everybody mm. just bought it nobody minded that was the way it was for the longest and time calvin bless him um because it got so hot uh went up and down queen street uh, begging and borrowing fans, so yes. to take take back and plug in the fans to try and get some air circulating. So it was an enormous struggle, but as you say, passion not just from Calvin and Brian Doherty, but from the townspeople from the who town. provided furniture, costumes uh, to make everything happen. But the passion was there, at least in part, because of the commitment to Shaw. And yes. at some point, we could chat about the mandate. It was very clear at the beginning that the mandate was Bernard Shaw. And for three years, three years, it was Shaw and nothing but Shaw. And in the fourth year, there was an O'Casey. Uh, and then in, in, in 1966, Barry Morse came in for a year. And yes. it was all Shaw again. But that was the last season. 66 was the final season when it was Shaw and nothing but Shaw. But there still has never been a season without some shore in there. Interesting as well, I was talking to Bill Poole, who was the assistant general manager under Tom Burrows, Burrows, B-U-R-R-O-W-S, I hasten to add, who was an amazingly driven and passionate man. And you might want to add about Tom Burrows. He was very instrumental, obviously, and helped, I think, as a huge diplomat, from what I gather from Bill. It was, he helped smooth out lots of the of the anti-shore feelings when they were attempting to get the new space. But he talked about as well, Bill talked about, uh, he shared that there was so much was done back then that I had no idea about. Camerata, a summer music festival came. CBC came down and recorded music festivals that the shore was putting on. I thought I was the first person to come down with CBC. Mm. It's all been done, you know, before. And they also had a school of music here that was operated under the shore banner for six weeks. So. It's really interesting how there was so much, there was involvement in the community even back then. Of course, there was no accommodations. Nobody had any accommodations. There was no place for people to stay. And I think one of the most interesting things was listening to Martha Mann. She was talking about, uh, she was designing and, and she said she made $450 a week, but she was living in Toronto and it was really hard to, to negotiate what they were doing over the phone because she had to drive backwards and forwards on the QEW. So going backwards and forwards was almost limiting. And so, again, she said they loaned everything from the Welland Community Theatre from Niagara Falls, New York. Stratford loaned this poor little up and coming little, you know, summer festival, some of their costumes, because they'd had Julius Caesar, so they loaned them their festival for Androcles, their, their clothes from their festival for Androcles. And, and she said it was, uh, you know, they, had, they got it from Malabar as well. And the very first costume that was ever actually made was made for Denise Ferguson, and it was cost $75, and that was an exorbitant amount of money. Mm. But <clears throat> I, think it's, uh, I think it's really, it's interesting how they didn't really get an office. There was nothing until Ray Wickens came along in 1965, and finally there was an office and a place where they could actually go. <laughs> there was a place on the main street. I mean, those days must have been heady. They must have been heady. Yeah, and I, I think we'd agree that it, it could not have succeeded without the enthusiastic support of many people in the town. But at the same time, and you referred to this, there was a significant opposition in the town. And balancing those was one of the great challenges that faced the festival in the early years. The, the townspeople, many of them, uh, were suspicious of actors. Rhodes and um, vagabonds. Rhodes and vagabonds, long, long hair, smoking dope, drinking, causing chaos and, and, and havoc. That was the, the image. Uh, and there was a lot of opposition to them. And to eventually, as tourists began to come, opposition in the town 
uh, to tourism um, yes. with anecdotes, stories of uh, tour buses being stoned, I mean, people throwing gravel at, at the, the tour buses. And then when, when Brian Doherty said, it's time for us to have a new theater, uh, strong, strong opposition to that and to Brian Doherty and Calvin Rand personally. So those struggles, the, the challenges, conflict even that was there continued for a few years uh, I think it's so fascinating the... to hear how you know there was I mean I guess Paxton really Paxton Whitehead really wanted to have a place that was on the golf course he wanted to extend have yeah I mean the the, the 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 first choice location was by Fort Mississauga yes um uh, on, on on the golf course with, as Brian Doherty said, a wonderful vista across the lake. You could have a restaurant down there looking out over the lake. And didn't uh, all, the, all the ladies of the, the, the volunteer organization, which was the early guild, did they not all resign in protest? They resigned because many of their spouses were golf club members and one consequence of putting the theater on the golf course, whilst the <laughs> golf course would have to go somewhere else. And the lo proposed location was the commons. And that, you know, having golf course on the commons uh, created all kinds of difficulties. So in the end, Brian and Calvin and others gave up on Fort Mississauga. Then Queens Royal Park uh, was a, a, another choice. So it wasn't until well into the pr planning process that the current location, which was on the edge of town, so not, not such a nuisance, as it were, that that location was. And they even wanted it to be in Queenston. I even I read that Queenston was even a suggestion. Yeah, get, it out, out, out even get, further get rid of them. Get rid of them. Yeah. I think what did it, what, what, what convinced in the end many uh, opponents was probably when, when the Queen came to celebrate the opening oh, of yeah. the festival. Yeah, okay, if the, queen, the Queen's okay with it. And the mayor okay. came to that opening. And the mayor came, and, 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 yes. but the train was late. They were living on the train. The train was late getting in St. Catharines. Uh, the show started, I forget the time, maybe 10 o'clock, <clears throat> which you never can tell. And Prince Philip promptly fell asleep uh, because it was late and he thought, sure, boring. Uh, the Queen, <laughs> bless her, stayed, stayed awake. But if the Queen is okay, then we should be okay. And, uh, and then opposition never entirely disappeared, as you know. Let's move up. Let's um, move up from the early days, 60s. Let's go as uh, through Paxton Whitehead. He then, uh, he gave over to, obviously, the next major artistic director. We've got Barry Morse, and we've got, after Barry Morse, we have, um, who came after Barry Morse, exactly? Was it? Well, Paxton came after Barry Morse. Paxton Barry Morse. after Barry Morse. Then, go ahead. Because Barry did was very successful, did a wonderful man and Superman in 1966. Yes. But at that time, he was a big name on television in right. The Fugitive, which Fugitive, some that's right. all, all, all the <laughs> members will 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 remember. And people he love seeing him here. Yes. Yeah, he couldn't he couldn't make the balance between running the Shaw Festival and being a, a TV star, so he just did the one one season. And then '67, it was 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 Paxton. And Paxton uh, was very uh, young, wasn't he? He was the youngest artistic yeah. director. He was very young. Right. I can't remember his age, but but certainly, and, but well connected. Twenty nine. Well connected. Very well connected. Yes, and yeah. visionary, and visionary, and, and, uh, and yes, yes and no, yes and no, okay. because there was part of Paxton that said Stratford clearly is very successful. And one of the components of Stratford's success is bringing in star names. Yes. And right from the beginning, Alec Guinness, Tyrone Guthrie. Oh, it's, it's very, I think very important to remember that the beginning of the Shaw Festival had none of the pomp and circumstance that Stratford had. I mean, the opening of Stratford with, 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 with Guinness and Guthrie and Tanya Mazevich. Uh, and then other Alan Bates and big names like that. It was was big news uh, in the theatre world generally. Uh, the opening here, they were not. They were they weren't even press. professionals, were they? They were non. They were non professional, no, not, 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 and nobody was getting so, paid. So I think part of Paxton's vision was well, I'm not. I probably can't get Alec Guinness, uh, but I can get Stanley Holloway. Okay? I can get Ian Richardson, who who became a much bigger name later on. Uh, so it was kind, kind, kind of. And his uh, big coup de was getting Jessica. Yeah, uh, Jessica Tandy. Yes. 
And that's great, but that was very not the vision that Christopher had yeah. when when he followed. Yeah. And it but it was to Paxton's credit that the the beginnings of a repertory structure began, it's and the nice. beginnings of an ensemble were and there. And I think through. I think that's important because the repertory system it, it's exciting, but it also meant which is what we love any of us who appreciate this, of course, that people would come and stay overnight and they could stay two yeah. nights and see all the plays they wanted. They wouldn't have to wait for five days to see all the plays. Repertory system allows you to come and spend, which is what we want, people to stay overnight. And, and so they could see things. And I think that's the key. Although um, I think, and I think actors, I think we all found it, we, I think the majority of us find it exciting. It's a, being in a repertory company, you, you get to exercise your muscle and uh, it's 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 wonderfully fulfilling and it, it was a very made, successful model yeah it made good marketing sense so and much sense. From, from the actor's point of view that wonderful experience of get, getting to know your colleagues uh getting to trust them getting to be familiar with their working procedures uh, mm -hmm. and creating a level of trust confidence among the group and giving you a paycheck yeah. For in the early days, maybe no more than two or three months, uh, much longer now, but a kind of security of income that was possible in Canada then only at Stratford. And but Paxton did extend yeah. the season too, didn't he? He also did that. He extended it to absolutely, to absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And he he widened the mandate. Um, yeah. I mean, insofar as the Shaw had a formal mandate in the early years, it was Shaw and nothing but Shaw. And then it was Shaw and his contemporaries and Paxton brought in those con contemporaries. Um, and so developed the festival in very important ways. And was it under Paxton the, the first non, no, it wasn't, is it under the first non Shaw play was introduced? No, that was, that was 62, 63, 66, 64. Four, five, five. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Out Plow the Stars, I think. And um, that was because there was an associate artistic director then who was it's Irish uh, and wanted um, uh, Okay. See. And, and interestingly, uh, in the same year, and the Shaw has a wonderful history byline, a history time frame, I should say, on their site. It's full of fabulous yeah. facts. Um, but it is interesting that the first grant the Shaw received was back in 1965 from the Ontario Arts Council for $10,000, the beginning of, a, you know, the financial wizardry that we now have our superstar, Mr. Yeah. Jennings. That, that was a, a pretty hefty sum of money. So, so it was a worry, though. Yeah. Babs were, were worried with the money, and this was under, under Paxton. So in the 70s, when... Um, as you'll recall, um, or remember, or be familiar with, uh, uh, yeah. the, the Canadian theatre was was finding its feet in a much stronger way than had been true in the 50s. And we're getting Carrigan, uh, we're getting Theatre Pass Murai, we're getting Canadian activists saying of the Shaw Festival, and even to some extent of Stratford, why is public money going into theatres that celebrate the work of, almost exclusively celebrate the work of, and produce the work of foreigners? Uh -huh. Why are we doing that? Why are we doing that? And there were big questions from the Ontario, Ontario Arts Council, Canada Council, why should we be giving money to these summer festivals that are, uh, attracting tourists for their income and not doing any Canadian plays. They're hiring Canadian actors, artists, uh, yes. although Stratford was still bringing in big names, but why are we using public money to support the plays of Bernard Shaw and William Shakespeare? Um, and it, it, yes. it, it, it was a, 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 an important moment that was, was eventually overcome, um, but this sense that the Shaw is a, a summer straw hat theatre um was was gathering momentum um let's jump ahead and, let's jump ahead a little here so that we get into the next uh, era after paxton and 
after a rather a darker time with maybe uh, one season with uh, Richard Krish Krishna. Um, but then, yeah. and, and then Christopher is hired. He's asked three times to take the gig, refuses three times, and eventually comes down and says that he looked around the gardens and found them to be utterly disgusting, decided he could do something with those gardens. <laughs> so he takes the gig. I know this, you know, and he does say that. It's a bit apocryphal, but he does yeah. actually say those words. And uh, then has to ask, then he asks Leslie Yeo to step in for him for a, a year. And Leslie puts uh, Blight Spirit, and Village Wooing, and and uh, You Never Can Tell up. And then Christopher comes down. Then we enter the Christopher era. So let's talk about the beginning of the Christopher era and how he steps in and 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 what his, you know, his enormous contribution was as he, as he comes in and takes over this festival. We didn't even like Shaw that much, as we all know, we didn't really enjoy Well, he, he, was, he was very, very open about not liking Shaw. Um, and that was because of the productions of Shaw he'd seen in England primarily, but also on the West Coast that were dull and reverential. And one of his objectives was to uh, re rethink Shaw, shake up Shaw, uh, make Shaw more challenging to actors and to audiences. So take away the reverence and let's make sure that people are engaged with the ideas uh, of, of the play. And I suppose the best example of his shaking things up and shaking the audience up as well um, was was his Saint Joan in, in 1981. Why did it shake where, people up? Why did it shake people up so much? Well, I, I, I'm pretty sure that it was the first time there had been any nudity right, right. in a Shaw production, and that was male nudity in that case. Uh, uh, Christopher had a soldier waiting for the wind to change on the River Loire. And he said, what do soldiers do when they're by a river and they're just waiting? Well, they get washed. They, they take that opportunity to, uh, to bathe. And so he had a soldier take his clothes off and, as it were, jump into the, into the river. That was only a bum view, only a bum, but that was enough to shock people. I think it's really important and, to you that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Leonard. Go ahead. Well, I'll just say the other thing that shocked them is that, that um, he, you remember all remember the 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 epilogue to Saint Joan, yes. uh, where Shaw takes the the time frame forward to where uh, Joan is 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 uh, being beatified, yes. and one has to reflect on the, the changed circumstances. Think about that. Uh, Christopher and many others thought the epilogue superfluous, just added an unnecessary half an hour onto the play, so he cut it. Right. At least he said he would. Uh, right. But then the short estate he, said, "I was going to say the short estate. Yes. You don't, you don't get the play. You don't get the play at all." So he, he very reluctantly uh, uh, had to do it. But uh, I, I, I was there, and he had a program note saying, "Look, I've been required to do the epilogue. Uh, there'll be an intermission after the the scene six, the trial and the burning." And then the actors will read from lecterns the epilogue. Yeah. And uh, it was clearly saying, if I were you, I wouldn't bother staying. Yes, I, I stayed, of course. <laughs> uh, and that's what happened. So he fulfilled the, the letter of the, the law, but not the spirit. But the whole thing was was this, this you know, sure's not easy. Uh, you, we need to be challenged, we need to shake, shake things up. We need to think about what Shaw's doing, why he's doing it, how he's doing it. Uh, and make sure matter. Again, well, he also, he, also that. he had the, uh, I think what was really to remember is that he came like the big three, really. I think Christopher came with Cameron Porteous. Cameron Porteous, yep. what a, you know, and he had Paul Reynolds as his uh, yep. producer, and Paul Reynolds as the president of equity. And so when he came down here, it brought an enormous amount of clout. And he also had Jeffrey Dallas. So he had amazing. And then he brought down from Vancouver, he brought Jimmy Mizon, Nora, oh, he brought actually, Camille yeah. Mitchell, he brought Martha yeah. Burns, he brought, you know, the, he brought these amazing people with him and, and, and Nicola Cavendish. And, and then he's, his, he had this company started, this is what made it so wonderful, but with the design concepts that Cameron brought to it, there was a change of an aesthetic, as Carolyn McKenzie put it to me the other day, it was just so, he 
Cameron changed the aesthetics. And I think it's important that we, are, we don't just remember what happened on the stage, we happened behind the scenes because, you know, when you bring in like the new design concepts and you bring in like, the brilliance of Murray Morrison, who was not many people might remember Murray, but we certainly do. He was a brilliant in the, in the you know, working in the scene shop and he brought in, they all started the bringing in the idea of hydraulics. When you bring in hydraulics, it changes everything. When you bring in movable platforms, chucks, you can bring, you can move sets around. It changes what you can do on the stage, but the hydraulics, that changed everything. And then when the show gets to have its own, and they moved out to a, you know, Virgil and they had scene shop and the prop shop, all of a sudden, everything changed what they could do on the stage. I mean, and now it's changed again, obviously, where you have projections, mm -hmm. like the, it changes through time. But I think looking at what he came down, what he brought to the festival with the enormous influence of Cameron Porsches, how that changed. And, you know, the wonderful Jeffrey Dallas, this, these, the team he had, and he had, again, it's again, we remember the, the, the infrastructure, the Judy Richardson's, the Kathy Holmes, the people that were there beside them. And, and it continues to this day. You know, you've got to have the, the, the teamwork, the, the infrastructure, and you've got to have the Tim Jennings and the Tim Carroll together. You've got to have this. And it's always been that way. And we, we tend to uh, look at the, just the work, but it's the, what goes on behind is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little about some of the other things that Christopher did in, that, uh, in, those, in the early 80s? Yeah, I want, want to stress as well the the fragility of the the early years for Christopher. Just as there was great fragility at the beginnings of the festival for financial and other reasons, the fragility at the beginning of Christopher's 23 season tenure, uh, that 23 could easily have been just one or two. Boy, because <laughs> when, when, when Christopher came in, he wanted to provoke. Yes. What, what the Doolittle say, I'm willing, I'm waiting, I'm wanting. Uh, Christopher was all of those things to provoke, to shape things up, to make people take notice of the Shaw Festival. And he shook yeah, them and, up. And in it's just interesting, at the time, he wasn't even allowed to bring Nicholas to the opening nights. He wasn't allowed to bring his partner and later husband to the openings. I mean, he certainly broke through boundaries. He broke through ceilings. He, 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 he did indeed. And it was partly, partly not entirely through sex. That I mean, brief, brief nudity is 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 one thing in St. Joan. When when you have uh, overt sex and when you have uh, rape with a wine bottle uh, in in one of the plays he he did. When you have audiences walking out in protest about that, you've got a certain kind of fragility. And when 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 one of those uh, walkouts is led by the wife of the chair of the board uh, is Calvin Rand's wife, then you've got real fragility and precariousness and, and uncertainty. And he had all of those to contend with willingly because he was achieving what he wanted to achieve. People were taking notice and saying, what the hell is going on at the Shaw Festival? It's Nicholas was telling me, Nicholas was telling me, Nicholas was telling me that he went into McClellan's, a wonderful McClellan's, love those Scotch yeah. And he went in and they said, uh, when he went in, oh, um, would you mind signing this petition? It's a petition to get rid of the artistic director at the Shaw Festival. <laughs> Christopher said, um, maybe I won't sign that. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but then the positive thing, I mean, there are many, many positive things, uh, but his, Christopher's leadership on acquiring the George, uh, that, well, within a cinema, uh, and you've got two theatres that you control, two theatres that are now under the Shaw Festival's own control, which might yeah. make a big difference. Yes. Absolutely, because the as, as, as you know, the courthouse was and is, is leased uh, and a limited number of things the Shaw can do to that building. So what was it, three or four seasons ago, the elevator broke right. down during the summer and the Shaw Festival was not free to fix it. And it wasn't a priority for the town, so it didn't get fixed. And there was a number of embarrassing moments. And wonderful that. what Walter Carson's money did to the Royal George. Interesting as well, I think that, I mean, I made it into this Edwardian theatre. It's a beautiful place that we all 
feel very fond of. And it also gave them a place to call their own with the bar downstairs and, yeah. and then you've got snacks, Saturday night at the George, and, and it became a real home. And because the town was a bit of a dive, remember, during the 70s as well, right? The Prince of Wales, which was a complete dive, like people, it was known as the place that was kind of like a flop house almost. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you yeah. know, you went there and people would, you know, you stayed away from it. And women were told not to go anywhere near the Prince of Wales. Look at the change now. But so it finally, the having the George was really important. And I think it's interesting to know as well that Christopher put all the musicals in the George because he yeah. didn't believe in miking. He didn't want to mic the acts. He didn't believe in putting a musical on the main stage, which of course changed later with Jackie and to huge yeah. success. But uh, he wanted to keep it as a, a pure, he didn't believe in miking. And, but the Royal George yeah. was a, a fabulous to be in and uh, downstairs was crowded, but still there's warmth to the theater. And uh, mm -hmm. it was a, I think the town itself uh, really appreciated having it on the main street. Although, as we said, he was still experiencing, there was still us and them. And even when I arrived, it was us and them, the townies and us. And you didn't really mix with them still. And actors were still renowned and there was a lot of big parties going on. <laughs> Everyone was young and there were places were a bit noisy and messy, I'd say messy. I think there was a lot going on that the town had a right to feel concerned about. And <laughs> land were worried about renting to them. And uh, we had some, yeah, I think it was, he had to fight a lot of that and changed it. Yeah. I mean, it changed slowly. Yeah. And, and then in, in terms of what he put on the stage, after he yeah. finally embraced Shaw because he had a chance to do it properly and yes. encourage that Shaw be done properly. That is the, in a way that creates an engagement and involvement. Mm -hmm. He then could um, modify the mandate. Certainly it was never going to be only Shaw, but Shaw and his period. So that's when you get the great Chekhovs and the, the Ibsens being, being done as well as Wild and Coward and wonderful cav cavalcade, but the mandate still um, defined, defined as eventually uh, Christopher came up with the uh, notion of the, the beginnings of the modern world. Yes, and, that's it right. brought, and, and great whatever, things it brought, it brought things together. Brought things together. Now I don't know how much that matters. Uh, we we can get onto this later, but. Um, I think I think Cavalcade was you know everyone who was in Cavalcade we were it was our you know the thing that you know you never forget and it was the most astonishing thing and it wasn't a short piece but it did again with the concept of the revolve there was a heavy change in that than what we could do design wise and it was a magnificent piece to be a part of um mm -hmm. I think that Christopher certainly made the great thinking made gave the meat to shore and allowed us to understand every every Shaw character there's not a dull un unintelligent character in Shaw everybody has an opinion and everybody's an intelligently written character and and when you lay out his ideas you put them on that washing line you hang them up for people to see people could go away feeling like they've been changed and I think he did that I mean moving ahead a little I think that when you look at that it was still heavy male oriented on the stage let's talk about Jackie coming in and how Jackie she started, she, she, Christopher extended the mandate, which was good. He put that fight up and he got it and he won it so that the next artistic director didn't have to have that fight. And Jackie took with it and ran with it. And let's talk about what she did. And then she put the first women directors, the first women playlists and the first French Canadian play. Let's talk a little about what she did. Yeah, I so many, many, many things that two that uh, I think are most meaningful to me and others, are, are, are digging for plays by women of the period. So staying very much in the sense of it's uh, it, it, it Shaw and his contemporaries. Uh, hidden gems was the phrase that was used. And women playwrights that have been long neglected were brought onto the, the stage by Jackie, the one I remember most is a woman named Gita, Gita Saudi, mm -hmm. a wonderful play called Rutherford and, 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 and Son. And she, she made a deliberate and very successful effort to find those plays and give them prominence. Jackie, as you know, was also very fond of American drama, which Christopher had not, not neglected. There had been American plays in there. Uh, but, but Jackie Williams and Miller and O'Neill were far more prominent 
under her leadership than there had previously been. So I think there were, there, those are two one, wonderful achievements that opened up to audiences a whole range of experiences, especially with the hidden gems. I think otherwise... the hidden gems thing came out as well. I mean, also we were able to do that with, with Christopher and Neil and, and then on the CBC series, we were able to put things on the reading series that they were just, as Chris was saying, yeah. go into the archaeology. But of course we had with Neil, the amazing Neil Munro and digging into the Granville Barker collection, there were these wonderful gems that needed to be brought out. And, and so when Jackie went in and did that, it just widened the mandate and opened it up so much. And, and it, was, it, was, it was another exciting time. And it's interesting how acting styles changed as well through those years. You know, you look back at what the BBC did with Shaw in the 80s and look at the acting stars and then you see how it changed. <laughs> how we've changed now. There, there is a natural progression, a natural change. And I think Jackie's you know, era started to personify some of that as well. Yeah, I, I think that was a, a very successful transition uh, from one artistic director to, to another. I mean, very, very different people, very different tastes and, 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 and values, but the one complemented the other uh, very well. So they were, they were successful years. And then we let's, because I'm looking at the clock, um, yeah. then we've, interesting, we've got now, let's move into the Tim Carroll years as well. Let's yeah. let, not mean to dislike Jackie's thing. I want to say that we've, we've gone, we, we don't want to rush over hers and that's why we've named the studio after, they've named the studio after because of what she did, which was magnificent. Yes. And now we're actually in many ways with, with Tim's, uh, Tim Carroll taking the theater back to the community as well, which actually is <laughs> reminiscent of 1984 which was, mm -hmm. of course, 1984, Yorson, uh, well, it's amazing, uh, that took over the whole theater, which, when you think about it, what, could we do that today? I mean, they took over the entire town and the planes flying over and the, sh the stores boarded up their windows in the evening to be a part of it. And it was 12 different venues all around town and the whole community was a part of it. And people, actors in the show said it was scary. It was actually scary because nobody really quite knew what was happening and it felt like it was being, they were being taken over. And what an interesting interactive thing to do, how brave. And I think that Tim Carroll is doing that too. He's stretching it out and going into the community and outdoor performances have come back in a, in a big way with, with Tim, which is, I think, very exciting. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, I, I, I think there are that, the community, the relationship between the Shaw Festival and the community, has of course been important from the very beginning. And, and TC is, is continuing that, building on it in a diff, different way, uh, not, not a 1984 way. And, and in some ways, if the, if the pandemic has been a blessing, it, it is that it has forced uh, upon the, the administrative and the artistic leadership, this need for creativity, and the festival has, has come through the pandemic, if it's over, yes. um, in a financially secure way. And I think has built into the programming uh, cr creative performances. Um, now, now TC did some before pandemic, that pop-up theatre in different parts of the town, unexpected surprises on the street corners and so on. Uh, so it was not, not entirely the pandemic, but there's been a lot more of that community outreach in education as well. Um, and, reflecting, and reflecting modern voices, which is what Jackie did too, right? Yep. Reflecting of the yep. modern voices and Tim, uh, Tim Carroll is certainly reflecting that. And especially now we have to and we must reflect diversity and, and, and equity and inclusivity. inclusivity. We have to, this is really, we can't move ahead unless we do this. And yeah. that's- and that, 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 is, that again is, is building on something, building on the concept of the ensemble, which has, has remained a strong feature of the festival from the late Paxton Whitehead years, but building on it, creating an ensemble, in with, with different criteria uh, and bringing new voices new faces uh, many younger actors into the into the ensemble which is we can't be, we'll, we'll get criticized for ever being you know all white guys and uh sure wasn't all white guy and 
Yeah, do you know? Do you think? Do you think he's when people say his plays are long and verbose and he cutting? Are they right? No, <laughs> um, they're, they're not long. I mean, yes, Back to Methuselah is long, and Man, the Full Man and Superman is is long, but Mrs. Warren's profession isn't. And was was uh, it the Gray Doctor Powell, Dilemma? Was it, was it Man and Superman with Gray Powell, the most amazing Man and Superman? Yeah, and th 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 this this is the response I think to complaints about long speeches. You get the right actor doing it. And the speeches don't seem long not at, at all. all. You get brilliant. Ben Carlson doing that Don Juan speech. You get Gray Powell doing it. And the audience bursts into spontaneous applause at the end of the speech, not the end of the play, but the end of the speech, which is unheard of I, in, 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 in well, most the, the operatic arias. Yes, that's yes. fine. You do that. But breaking into applause during a scene, mm -mm. but Gray created that, Ben Carlson created, because they had the talent. Sure helped them, sure helped them. And uh, that long speech in, 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 um, in, in St. Joan, the Inquisitor, you, you, get, you get the right actor doing it and the, you can hear a pin drop because yeah. one of the things that a sure audience now does, expects to do, is listen. Yes. Uh, and you can't blame the playwright for writing things that are worth listening to. If they're worth listening to and you've got the right actor, you have no problem with the length at all there. But I want to add as well, is it a crucial thing? I, I think um, Babs talked about mandate, about definition of what the Shaw Festival is. Mm -hmm. uh, TC has rejected the notion of, of term mandate. Okay, he pointed out quite rightly, it, it, it shares the same root as the word manacle. You're manacled, uh, mm -hmm. and he wanted to get rid of the manacles and open things up uh, that that are not not um, w not within the realm of, of a, a, a closely defined mandate. And who, who and that, would have thought happened. that? Who would have thought that sitting watching one man in an armchair, Stephen Fry, yeah. would have been yeah. such an enormous appeal? There you go. Yeah. So. That's there you go, and it, and it, but it's still in, in the festival language. We don't see the word mandate anymore, but we still see in the spirit of uh, spirit. Bernard mm -hmm. Shaw. And I take that to mean uh, that one of the key features of the Shaw Festival always was and remains. There is, it's a, it's a thinking person's Yes. Theatre. Uh, and this doesn't mean plays that are only about ideas. They're about ideas as represented through living human beings that have emotions and, and prejudices and biases as well. And all so the plays, you know, they definitely, the plays that we're seeing now do make you think. How can they not? How can You can watch The Baroness and the Pig. It makes you think. So it really does. It, and it, it absolutely it, and, and, does. I mean, I, I think that play in particular was very much in the spirit of Shaw. Sure. And several sure. other. No, some are not. I mean, I, I, to be honest, I'm no great fan of um, the importance of being earnest. Uh, you know, I'd like, I prefer wild earlier plays that are uh, provoke thought. Mm. Uh, the importance of being earnest, very clever, and it's very funny. Um, uh, I, I, I don't think really it's I only just read that uh, John Gilgood came and played John Worthing in uh, in The Importance of Being Honest back in the 40s at the Grand in, in London. In Did London, yeah, in London, yeah, in yeah. London, uh, uh, London, Ontario. Uh, London, Ontario. But I mean, I, but I, I'm, having said that, you know, Importance of Being I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's on, it's a terrific choice. It was wonderful. Please many audiences. And, and what, what we've got now, I think, is no discussion anymore, as we had in Christopher's time to some extent, well, we shouldn't be doing that because it's not in the mandate. When, once you get rid of that concept that there is, there are manacles, then that issue about whether or not we should be doing it, 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 it's, it is it's free. A it's a wonderful play for looking at the mandate as well, looking at the manners of the mandate. As we know, the guy and Sherry have done the, the manners of the mandate workshop for a lot of years, and they used the scene, the tea scene out of 
the importance of being honest as one of the prime examples yeah. of looking at the manners of the mandate. And, and I think for a lot of young actors still coming out, that, that period and wearing a corset and all that stuff, we say the corset, the long skirts, this is a wonderful play for looking at that and delving back. I and mean, we all love the yeah, down -to -down feel and, and all that. But this is these plays do give us that window back into that world. It is, uh, it's, it's hilarious. And, and there's so much subtleties and there's so much subtext to it all, which is, I think that makes it key as well. Is that, so if we look back at the decades, we look back at the, enor the enormous bravery and the chaotic craziness of the 60s, the, the people that came to work for no money at all. And then we move into the, the moving out of the, getting a, a space, and getting the big theater, finally getting the festival stage and expanding that with the amazing thank you to Elaine and Donald Triggs as well, the yep. production center and the amazing contribution of the guild. We mustn't forget the guild, the wonderful ladies and people of the guild, because they have been, we again tend to think about what we see at the top of the pyramid on the stage, but underneath the docents, the fundraising, the events, the special events that the guild do have been through from the 60s right up has been astonishing. And, and so we have that happening from Paxton up to then through to Christopher's astonishing years it put the Shaw Festival on the map against many tourists, I meant many, uh, I should say, locals anger at times. And the tourists that came, of course, there were different kind of tourists that come for the theater anyway. They're the ones that stay overnight, they drink wine, they buy tickets for other things, they, they certainly stay in the hotels, but they're not the ones you see crowding the streets. They aren't the same kind of tourists, I don't think. Was that sounding snobby? Probably I should be careful what I say. But, uh, you know, <laughs> be, careful, be careful what I say. But it's certainly, I mean, we, I can't imagine the night the Niagara on the Lake Vista without the Shaw Festival. What would we do without it? It's a major employer. So it brings enormous amount of, you know, the actors come and stay here, they spend money at the Value Mart, they go to the drugstore, they buy things. So we have this enormous turnaround. And, and so with Jackie opening it up to women in a different way, the women playwrights and directors that have never been seen on the stage before. And then we move into the Tim's work with taking it back to the community and, and being so inclusive and working with diversity in a way that no one had done before. Though I must say that I was in the first play that, you know, acted with a black actor on stage in Bly Spirit with uh, that, uh, no, Hay Fever, Hay Fever. With, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so we did have that, mm -hmm. but it was, it, it's uh, each artistic director has colored this festival with their own stamp and has given it such, um, you know, passion and have helped create and with their with the help of the Tim Jennings, the Paul Reynolds, the, the you know, the, the Mr. Burroughs, these are Tom Burroughs, these people have and obviously Brian Doherty as a producer, where would it wouldn't have happened without these people and uh, let's not forget, you know, all the, the wonderful people who have sewed and the Rita Browns and people who have put their fingers to the, the metal. Tom Burroughs, yes, thank you. Thank you. And, Col and Colleen Blake. Blake as well. Unbelievable, of course. Colleen Blake. Mm -hmm. There she is. You can see her, there's little glasses over coming up. And we would be, we can't, we can't run this festival. They can't run the festival without the enormous infrastructure there. And education has taken, has been a huge leap too. And under Suzanne Mary in the last few years has, it's reached out. The schools, I don't think they study sure, but you know, they should, <laughs> you know, we need to still bring them in, but it's an education as it's taking it out, the messages out there. Um, would you like to add anything else? We can see if there's any, Amy has got any questions that she wants to throw at us. We've taken a lot of the questions I've had. Yep. People have sent us beforehand. We've kind of answered. I know I had some. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll ask you quickly though, Leonard. I mean, you've been in this yep. relationship with the Bernard Shaw a good many years and relationships go through ups and downs. What have been, what's been your struggle with Shaw? Has there been a struggle with Shaw? No, no, it's been 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 a joy. I mean, I, I tell you, only one, only one. Shaw coined the word bardolatry. Bardolatry. How do you spell in that? Reference to Shakespeare. Spell it. Spell uh, it. Uh, bard. Uh, oh, B a r d. Yes. Bard. The bard. Yes. Because bard. he thought that you know, again, being reverential that uh, Shakespeare could do no wrong. Uh, <laughs> the, the, my struggle is not with short audiences or short actors or short administrators, short festival. It's to do with my own Shavian colleagues who 
practice what I call shawdolatry. They, they, they sure can do no wrong. Well, he wrote some pretty bad stuff. He said some pretty stupid things. He, many times he should have shut up. Uh, he talked too much. He wrote too much. Uh, but in the midst of all that, he did some wonderful things. And it's those wonderful plays, including wonderful. two that are on this season that I celebrate and uh, will we'll, we'll ne never tire. Though I am taking a break now as uh, uh, one of the plays and Tim Jennings will, will, will has heard this from me before, that for some unfathomable reason has never done is Ibsen's Doll's Hut, which is an absolutely seminal, crucial uh, play that um, is important in so many ways. I'm doing a new edition of Doll's Hut. Why haven't they done the done? apple cart? The apple cart hasn't been done either. The apple cart. Oh, it has been done. Yeah, apple cart. Yes, it has done. been done, but not for a long time. Yeah. No, not 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 regularly, but uh, I would I would choose Doll's House over the Apple Cart if, if yeah, given course. given the choice. So I'm doing that new edition before I go back to shore. Nice. All right, uh, Amy. We do have a a question here. Um, if you can speak to why some of the Shaw staff might leave, and they're they're specifically thinking of you know great people like Bill Schmuck. Um, and you know, sometimes obviously age and illness might take people away, but are there, is there falling outs among, uh, you know, between staff there? Well, that's a delicate question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we should touch that one, but people do move on to other uh, areas and uh, they take on other jobs, you know, and they also reach ages where they want to do other things. Um, I, I wouldn't know about falling out. If I did, I don't think we would talk about it. <laughs> No, Lena's not going to speak to that one either. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, uh, the, 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 the designs here are, you know, they, they are such a wonderful breed and they are themselves, they've created so many wonderful things and you feel very privileged to, when you get to work with certain designers when they, they take such care over you. And uh, when you're being looked after by the, the costume people here, it's the most astonishing thing. The detail, the detail that goes into the costumes, I think everybody knows this, it is beyond belief. And I, I say that one of the great gifts is, is, as an actress is being to be dressed by the Shaw Festival as an actress. You, you get dressed from the inside out as well. So, you know, you're wearing everything makes you feel like you're back in that period. And, and when you're doing period clothes. And uh, yes, it's that kind of detail, that kind of attention to detail that goes onto the set and goes onto the costumes. And the props, like everything that's on stage is, you know, is a movable prop is, uh, the detail is astonishing. Any others? No, that was it, I think. So unless anyone has any other questions, um, I think we'll wrap it up. And thank you very much to both of you for joining us today. That was a great discussion. Um, if people have questions that they want to send in, please feel free. Uh, you, can, you can email them to us, contact at nhsm.ca um, and we can get some answers for you if there's any other burning questions you might have. Um, and uh, our next lecture is Wednesday, March 30th. It's the final in the series, um, 11 a.m. on Zoom. And David Hemmings will be talking about some of the uh, famous heritage houses here in Niagara-on-the-Lake. So I know that'll be of interest to a lot of you. So thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, Leonard and Babs. And uh, oh, Rita, Rita had a couple comments. <laughs> we'll go back for a second, Rita Brown. Uh, she just wanted to make a few comments. The first O'Casey play was The Shadow of a Gunman. And also just when Shaw be, um, began, there was a huge push for tourism by Parks Canada. Uh, Calvin had told that he underwrote the first season with $800. Huh. So a few uh, a few little tidbits of great info from Rita. Wonderful Rita Brown, such an impact on the show. Thank you, Rita, for all your wonderful work. Thank you, Rita. Lots of comments from everyone about uh, you know thanks for the wonderful talk, very informative. So again, thank you, Leonard and Babs, for joining us today, and we'll see everyone Bye. in a couple of weeks. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.